had a wonderful time this morning. And you came back. And I, I'm glad you came back. I'm sure some of you talked about me. The Lord knows that. It's not hard loving some folks that are receptive and kind. That will hear the word of God. My wife heard the word of God. She's so happy that I'm going to smile more. We were in the car one day. We were together all the time. I mean, we were together all the time. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. And we got in the car. We had had intense fellowship in the car. Praise the Lord. They're normal. <laughs> My wife says, I know what we need to do as a family. I said, uh huh. She said, we need to practice kindness. I said, good idea, you start. <laughs> that didn't go over real well. Ah, uh, we're just normal folk. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 139 tonight. Let's stand together, if we can, just for a moment. How you doing, Jeremy? You all right? All right. There's a couple positions in the church you don't really want to covet. Sound man's one of those. You can't... Somebody's like, that's too loud. Then somebody's like, I can't hear. It's like the temperature of the church. We've walked into churches and there's blankets everywhere. <laughs> one pastor said, I'm up here preaching and I'm the one sweating. Now you can either put extra on or get a fan. But anyway, it's hard to please everybody all the time. But uh, I appreciate the sound man. And uh, by the way, I noticed your, your ushers all looked dapper. They all look alike, and they, I poking them. I'm like, look at these people. Aren't they neat? And uh, I'm really upset. I left my, um, my, my, was that a boutonniere for a guy? It was a Palm Sunday. Uh, what am I thinking? A palm branch. Yeah. Who was the lady here that gave me that? Nice lady today. So anyway, she doesn't like me. Uh, <laughs> Tell her I said that. But uh, I never had seen those before. You'd be amazed what you can do uh, if you'll just use some creativity. Everybody thinks they have to spend a lot of money to serve the Lord. We were in a central Ohio congregation, and I'm singing, I'm looking around, and I'm like, half these people look Amish. And we're in an English church, and I'm going, wow, they look, they look, kind of Amish. Well, come to find out that they were a church that was a missionary office for heaven to help these coming out of the Amish community to get adjusted to English life if they wanted to leave the Amish community. We were there a month or two ago and they had a big ball of grocery bags that they had shred, they'd pulled these grocery bags apart and they had made yarn out of plastic Walmart bags or Kroger bags. I don't know if you have Kroger down here or not. Uh, Piggly Wiggly maybe, I don't know. But they had made a big ball of plastic and they crocheted mats. I said, now what? What do you do with these mats? This is what their ladies group, one of the projects their ladies group had. They said, well, when people get flooded out in Kentucky or West Virginia 
And all of these family members are coming into one house. They don't have beds to lie down on. And so we'll send them these plastic made beds so their children at least can lay on the floor without it being on a cold floor. I thought that was neat. And I thought I'd pass that along since you all gave me the cross uh, today. I thought it was so nice too. Father, thank you for these people. Thank you for... Brother Todd and Miranda and Lord and each one that's here. And we thank you, Father, for the smiles that we're getting. And it's, I pray that it'll be contagious and rub off on me. And Lord, you'll just help us, Father, to be what you have purposed us to be. Pray that, Lord, you'd help us tonight and understand you're with us at all times. No matter what's going on in our life, you are there. Lord, if there be one lost tonight, may they be found and understand that you're not lost, they are. Lord, you'll help us through whatever storm we're going through. Sometimes the enemy reminds us, tries to tell us that you're not there. But God, you're always there. And I pray that, Lord, you'd help us tonight in Jesus' name. Psalm 139, if you want to read with me, verse 1. Psalmist David saying, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. We can give an altar call right now, couldn't we? Just reading that text. That's a wow, God knows me. Whoa, God knows me. Thou hast searched me and known me. It's not to scare you. It's to let you know God's not leaning over your shoulder ready to smack you. No, He wants you to know that He knows you. He understands what's going on. He knows your frame. He knows your faults. He knows your fears. He knows the facts of your life. Thou knowest my downsetting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither or where shall I go from thy presence? Where shall I flee? Go from thy spirit. Where shall I flee from thy presence? You may be seated tonight. Verse 14, I'll praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right. There's just so much good in this. Search me, O God. Verse 20. Three, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to know God's everywhere, all the time. God's there. You can't go anywhere, anytime, any place that God's not there. My family's together all the time, but sometimes we're not all there together. But God is really there all of the time. All the time, God's there. It doesn't matter if you're feeling blah or feeling blessed. God's there. Does it matter if you're the bully or being bullied? God's there. Healthy, unhealthy, rich, poor, confused, or you got a good clear direction, God is there for you. I had the world's meanest brother growing up. I'm living proof there is a God. The Lord saw me through those years. My brother Vernon, he was mean. They say he was meaner than a striped snake. I don't like any kind of a snake. I don't really know if I've even seen a striped snake, but that's how mean Vernon was. And he would, he would pick on me. He'd take, he, he, I, I, was, I, just, I just never did like to fight. And I, I, was, I, I was big enough to be a punching bag, but I was probably big enough to clobber him if I, if I would just swung back. He'd take my fingers, put them in his mouth, catch mom and dad missing, and he'd just go... <laughs> Like this, he'd get me down, put his legs on my shoulders and beat my chest. He was mean. And he'd go, <laughs> he was mean. I'm telling you, he'd, he'd, he'd fight just about anything that come around. And I didn't want to get in the crossfire 
Well, I was a paper boy. I was about 12 years old, and I was three houses from being home. I was passing my 60 papers, and out of a house come Jimmy, tearing at me like the Tasmanian devil. He was running, swinging. Now, Jimmy was a half sandwich shy of a full picnic. I'm just telling you. And he, had, he had difficulties in life, and he was angry at everybody. And all of a sudden, he's angry at me. And all I was doing was minding my own business. And he come tearing into me, and he comes a swinging at me. It, I mean, all arms. And I'm holding the paper bag up like this. And before I know it, out of the upstairs window, my brother Vernon was watching. And he looked down and saw Jimmy fighting on his little brother. And this is the same brother that my brother liked to go hee 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 and torment. But all of a sudden he saw somebody else picking on his flesh and blood. Out of the house comes Vernon. He's running like lightning. Jimmy looks over and sees my brother coming. I got the paper bag held up. Jimmy stops swinging. He takes off running. Vernon comes by me. I scream, get him, Vernon, get him, get him. <laughs> Vernon kept running. He got to the front steps where Jimmy had went behind the door. And Vernon starts beating on the door. He said, I tell you right now, you pick on my brother, you're picking on me. I'll whoop you. I'll whoop you. I'm like, that's right, that's right. You get it. Well, I got good news. Vernon turned out to be all right. He's pastoring now in Russell, Kentucky. <laughs> when I started pastoring in Huntington, West Virginia, Vernon would drive an hour to come up to be in service. He was backslidden in heart. And he just wanted to complain about everything. Well, I got sick and tired of hearing it, just to be honest with you, telling how wrong the church was and the church wasn't doing this and the church wasn't doing right and blah, blah, blah. I said, why don't you get your heart right with the Lord and get right real good and saved and get back in the church and roll your sleeves up and fight and join the army of God and quit complaining about everything. Well, he did. Praise the Lord. I, I, I had to be in the anointing of the Spirit when I said that because he could have whooped me if he wanted to. But I was older then. But, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to preach a message, uh, if you'll give me a few minutes tonight, uh, on a bully. I preach this message as often as I can. It's a serious subject. Now, my preaching style is different. I wouldn't ask you to pattern yours after mine. There's all styles of preaching. I said this perhaps before to you. It's like a potato. One elder pastor in our area said that preaching's like a potato. He said you can take a potato and you can bake it, fry it, mash it, make potato salad, make potato soup. Make french fries, potato chips, cut it raw and put salt on it. It's a good potato. Just don't eat them with the black spots in them. Amen. He said, but when it's all said and done, it's a potato, no matter what you do to it. And that's the way he said preaching is. He said, if it comes from heaven's courtroom and God has delivered you a message, the styles of the preacher might be different. He said, but just listen up and Take in the Word of God. Let it be nourishment to you tonight. And I, I preach a message that some of you are going to find strange in the midst of a revival meeting, but we're here to try to help you folk. And, and I've needed this message. I've needed this message. I've had wives of pastors come up and thank me. I've had board members come up and thank me. I've had grown men when I've preached on this message. They said, we've never heard it before. And we thank you for sharing. The title of my message is Spiritual Depression. In the pulpit and the pews. Strange revival message. If you don't like that message title, let's change it to Every Valley Shall Be Exalted. Brother Tomas was our missionary friend. From Mexico, all of these mission trips. Wow, I love it. I love it, and the vision that you've got. 
Brother Tomas was our missionary to Mexico. He was just a big old fella. His smile went from here to here. His hand was as big as a catcher's mitt. I couldn't under th- understand a thing that man said. Uh, he, uh, uh, and I don't speak good Appalachian well, and I definitely didn't speak Spanish. I had a Spanish ministry at the church. The only thing that I was able to say was El Pastor, Darren, and Gracias. I had Gracias, which means thank you down real well. My friends and I went to a Japanese restaurant. We had went to go hear a Crab Family concert, and before the concert, we went to this Japanese buffet steakhouse. And I had to go to the little boy's room, and I got up, and I'm looking around, you know, doing that man look, uh, trying not to act like we needed help. But the nice little Japanese lady knew that I needed the restroom, and she pointed a certain way. I looked at her and I said, gracias, and I kept walking. And as I was walking, I thought, idiot, she's not, she's, she's not Spanish. Tomas was. Tomas preached our camp. They would interpret his preaching into English. And he said, pray for my daughter, pray for my wife, pray for Egla, pray that we are safe, my children are safe, my wife is safe from the drug cartel in Mexico. And I was getting ready to preach to a bunch of preachers and pastors. And I had that opportunity that was rare. And I had that golden opportunity where I was going to go in there and I was just going to tell them what was wrong with the preaching and why our churches weren't growing. And I got the word early in the week that Tomas was murdered. And it was like the air in the balloon was let out. Our hearts were devastated. We were broken in spirit, still saved. But I'm telling you, it was a tough time. It followed the heels of Gordon Boggs, one of our pastors, that we had prayed for his healing. Yet the Lord divinely healed him miraculously and took him on to glory. And we understood, and I understood, that I wasn't going to go in there and Preach like a double barrel shotgun to those preachers. That wasn't the calling. The Lord wanted me to come in and preach something that would soothe the hearts of broken spirited people. Perhaps there's a broken spirited man here tonight, or a woman, or a child, or a teenager, that you are a person that is facing some crisis in your life. Maybe some dark times have come and it's hard to understand what God is doing or where God is even had in your life. I assure you, when you are minding your own business, passing papers perhaps, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Life comes at you like a crazy man named Jimmy. And you feel like you're going to lose the fight. I want to remind you, if you're in the church, we have an elder brother. Oh, he's much nicer than my brother Vernon. But he's looking from heaven and he understands where you're at. And he understands what's going on in your life. And when Satan comes to buffet you and torment your mind and he begins to bring affliction into your home and he stirs confusion and he begins to make you to be feeling so low even in your spirit, I want to remind you that God's eye is always watching you. God always sees you and He hears your cry. He understands the crisis in your home. He understands the pain in your heart. He understands that you're confused and you're overwhelmed. And when you're overwhelmed, the psalmist says, lead me to the rock 
that's higher than I. Thank God there's a hiding place even in the midst of a revival. We need to be reminded no matter how I feel tonight, I'm not saved by feelings. I'm saved by faith. And I understand that I'm kept by the same grace of God whether I feel like shouting glory or I can't hardly even say amen. I want you to understand tonight God sees you. God cares for you. God loves you and he adores you. He isn't angry at you. He's not mad at your family. God loves you. Would somebody say amen? We find ourselves sometimes with our back against the wall, proverbial wall. I face this enemy that's a real enemy and as a pharmacist and as a pastor The past few years I've preached hard on this subject. A lot of people aren't comfortable with somebody sharing the fact that sometimes people get overwhelmed in life and they don't get a little occasional feeling of the blah. They get to the point where they feel like they have sandbags on their chest and sandbags on their legs, and they can't hardly move. They no longer feel like they can function normally in life. They can't function as a mama or a daddy. As a child, they begin to withdraw in school, and they begin to not, no longer, their, their grades are failing. Uh, and as an older person, they, they can't drive, or maybe their spouse is lost or, or, or left them on to glory. And all of a sudden, you've got all of these segments of people in our society, whether they're a teenager or whether they're a senior citizen, they're facing this oppression and they're facing depression and they come into our church and they try to find a place of refuge. May I say to you, the house of God ought to be a place of peace and comfort and rest. I, it doesn't matter if you have cancer heart disease or if you're struggling with depression there's a healer in the house and the church wants you to understand we love you and we care for you and if you need a place if you need an oasis if you need a place to get away you can come right here to the first free will Baptist in Washington we'll love on you we'll pray for you we'll cry with you and every once in a while we'll dance together because the Lord is good and worthy of all praise I understand that Christians aren't immune to the day-to-day, hand-to-hand combat of life. I preached this from Ohio, and I had put in my notes that, that the hostility and the hatred and the uh, hurricanes, well, that was before we came to North Carolina a lot, or Louisiana. And we begin to realize these are realities. They're just not catchphrases. And that people face life. And as a pastor, I often said that life's not for sissies. Because life sometimes comes at you with a full force. And unexpectedly storms come to every life. You're either in a storm right now, or you've come out of one, or you might be in one tomorrow. But oh, I'm so glad as one of God's people, I understand who's on board. Amen. And I understand that this spirit of depression comes into our church. I pastored in the inner city. There was so much, there was so much illicit drug use. And dope was rampant. I was a pastor that buried a lady shot in the head uh, with her nine-year-old watching. I, I, she was in the next room. Uh, I understand that a lot of people are are affected by the drug epidemic. And may I say to you one reason why people get on drugs, they don't wake up in the morning and say, "Oh, oh, today I think I'm going to become a drug addict. Sometimes these people are overwhelmed with depression and the oppressions of life. And they want to escape reality. And they want a, want a feeling that will take them out of the, the, the state of emotional being that they're in. 
Do you understand that the largest segment of suicide in our country isn't the 18 to 20 year olds? It's the 80 to 84 year old white men basically are one of the highest segments of suicide in our country. You say, preacher, why are you preaching the way that you preach it? Because I've dealt with suicide in my congregation. And my, my boy had three commit suicide in his senior class. And I want you to understand that the elder age is more successful. And we as a church have to understand that sometimes people need to go see their physician to find some medical treatment to help them in depression but we've got to get to the idea and the understanding that we can't criticize somebody if they're facing this we've got to put our arm around them and love them and nourish them and care for them and serve them somebody help me preach today because we want you to know you are loved people come to our church dependent on dope they're drowning in debt dabbling in sin but they're dancing with depression and they don't want to dance. That thick feeling that affects every aspect of life. You see, the enemy will come into the church and here's the pillars of the church. And the enemy will come in and try to get your mind focused on what's not right in your life instead of who is right in your life. And so we got to get our minds focused back and understand that Ministers and lay leaders and people sitting in our pews, they're not exempt from this feeling of depression. Are you with me? Elijah was depressed. Jonah was depressed. Moses was depressed. The psalmist David was depressed. Paul, Peter, John. I can go down a long list of people and put Darren's name on that list. And I'm thankful again that I have a person that's with me named Jesus Christ who promised I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Well, I want to turn this, turn the page if I can, and I'd like to get to a few good things tonight to help us. First of all, I want to remind you that the Lord is with me everywhere I go, and all the time I go anywhere, the Lord is is with me. Uh, the psalmist David said the very first point in my message is we need to devote ourselves entirely to the shepherd. If you want help tonight in this message in any area of your life, you need to devote yourself entirely to the Lord God Almighty. He'll be there with you when no one else can be there with you. Why could the pastor come tonight with his daddy being sick in a hospital somewhere. Why, he can come here tonight and leave his daddy with the Lord and the Lord would say, I'll come with you. You leave him here with me and I'll go and be with you because I'm his shepherd and I'm your shepherd and I can be in two places. Oh, I can be in more than two places. You see, when your wife is home perhaps washing the dishes and she's crying over a mountain of clothes, the Lord can come there in the house and help you there and help your child that just got on the big yellow bus and the shepherd will get on the big yellow bus with your little seventh grader and go be at school with them. And the Lord can be on the school bus and he also can be in the workplace and he's there in the home. The Lord is all places at all times. When you're depressed sitting in a waiting room and your loved one's in an operating room, I want to remind you the shepherd of the valley is back in the operating room while you're in the waiting room the Lord is God Almighty is there I'm preaching and I'm hoping somebody's getting something out of what I'm preaching if you walk into a cemetery I want to remind you you're not in that cemetery alone the Lord God Almighty the resurrection and life is with you he's the one that promised I'll never leave you I'll never forsake you what a God what a promise bless his holy name David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David could look back over his life and he could look over the past events of his life and he could see 
how he even had his own children coming against him. And King Saul hated him. And all of the battles that David had faced, whether he was fighting a lion or a bear or Goliath or his own lust, the Lord God proved faithful to that man. And I believe as a seasoned man that David now, the king shepherd, could say, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I, there's, he, I don't want another. I don't need another Lord. I don't need another shepherd. The Lord has been with me when I have faced the greatest battles of my life, when I have faced my own failures, when I have faced my own family. The Lord has proven faithful to me in the past. And why should the present be any different? And the future will be the same. The Lord is with me. May I say to you, we need the shepherd. We are sheep. Sheep are ignorant and sheep are not very bright animals. Have you ever seen a sheep in a circus? No. Sheep are defenseless. They can't do anything uh, other than depend on the shepherd. I say so much, a porcupine can throw its quills if an enemy comes against it. A turtle can get in its shell and hide from an enemy. A dog can bark, at least scare you with its bark. A deer can run. And a mama skunk will look at its babies when it's in danger and say, children, let us spray. But I tell you, sheep are defenseless without the shepherd. I wish somebody would go like this. Praise the Lord. The shepherd is my defense and he's on my side whether I'm depressed or whether I'm impressed or whether I'm feeling like going whoop or whether I'm going whoa. The Lord is on my side. Glory to God. The shepherd is with me. And if you'll devote yourself to the shepherd, I assure you, the Lord will help you through the battles that you're going through. You need to declare your salvation. I mean, you absolutely need to be reminded tonight. Now look up here. If you're not saved, you have every reason in the world to be blah. You have every re- You have no hope other than what we're offering you through Jesus Christ. You may have put your hope in Hillary. You may have put your hope in President Trump, this and that. I'm going to tell you, they're mere men and women. Men and women will disappoint you and let you down. But there's a high priest named Jesus Christ. I'm saying you can always count on Him. And you devote yourself to Him. And if you're you're saved tonight, you need to declare your salvation. I mean you look at yourself in the mirror and go, Look at you, buddy. Look at you. You're a man of God. And lady, look back at yourself and go, Woo, look at you, girl. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are a prized possession. We face depression in our home. and We've struggled with it. None of us are immune from the commonalities of life. And there was a time when my wife collapsed on the stage. We thought she was going to die on the, in the pulpit pews in the choir. And we were singing, I'm going home with Jesus. Next thing I know, the pastor's behind me saying, I need help, I need help. We thought Mama Lord was going home with Jesus. Bless the Lord. It was a bad moment in our life. My daughter's crying over. My boy's out somewhere on Facebook. I don't know. He was actually on his phone trying to call somebody. We're in a country church. And it got to the point where my wife, she, uh, her eyes were fixing. And she was uh, gasping. And I smacked her. I smacked her a few times. And uh, she promises to get me back. I tell my cousin, I said, if you find me dead in bed, would you make sure they do an autopsy? I said, because she's promised to get back at me. She went on a helicopter fly. It took them 45 minutes to get to that little country church. Make a long story short, she had vertigo. Wow, what a way to go with vertigo. She got home, and she wanted to curl up in the bed. I mean, she couldn't go to the bathroom without, you know. It was bad. It was bad. 
sunglasses on. I just glow from heaven off of my head, I guess, but that helped her <laughs> focus her eyes. The devil came to her. You hear me? The enemy of our soul slithered in to the back bedroom and told Mrs. Lore, your husband's killing you. Church after church, service after service. Well, you know he can take those, your children and they can go sing without you. They don't need you. They'd do just as good without you. You just stay right here and you rest and you let them go on about it. And all of a sudden, she heard the Spirit of God, Sandy, get up. Sandy, today, walk down the hall and met Sandy, go make yourself a sandwich. Get up. Walk a few steps. Bless Jesus. Bless Jesus. Bless His name. The Lord was there. Mama Lord missed three appointments. We made those up. We had a trip planned to Canada for my daughter's graduation. She woke up. She said, let's go. I'm like, seriously? Let's go. She wore her glasses the first eight hours. The next day she took her glasses off. We got to the border of Canada. She's feeling better. She's getting a little perky at this point. We have a crowbar this big underneath our front seat. We got a wrench this big. She uses them for weapons in case we get in danger. We get to the border of Canada. This lady who almost died a few days earlier in the church pews, two weeks earlier, the Canadian Border Patrol looked at us and said, Do you have any weapons in your car? Mrs. Lord says, Not unless you count a crowbar and a big wrench. And then she reaches down to get them. And he said, I want to see your hands, please. I thought, dear Lord, he'll shoot me. I'm the biggest target and I'm right here by him. But you know what? Sometimes you need to say, by the blood of Jesus Christ, I am a child of God. I do not feel God right now, but I know He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And I declare to the enemy of my soul, I am saved and I am kept by God's grace. Whether I feel like shouting or whether I just can't even get a prayer through, God knows my heart and God loves me. And I declare my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank God I'm saved. Devote yourself to the shepherd. Declare your salvation. I'd say determine to stand. I mean get up. You're going to determine to get up. Jesus went by the man that was at the pool of Bethesda. You want to be whole? I don't have nobody to help me get in the pool. That wasn't the question. Do you want to, do you want to be made better? And I'm going to tell you tonight, no matter what you're facing, no matter what problem you have in life, you're going to have to determine to overcome it by the power of God. And you say, well, I, I don't know about depression being overcome by the power of God. Well, there's some of your folks that have cancer. We're praying for their healing. We're praying for your pastor's father's healing. There's some great crises going on in people's lives right now. And I don't care what emotional wreck you are tonight. You might be filled with anger. You might be filled with bitterness. You might be filled with malice and, and wrath. But I'm telling you, if you'll determine I'm not going to live like this the rest of my life and I'm going to fight this battle and I'm going to put it on a spiritual level, the Lord will be nigh to you. The Lord will help you. And you're going to have to start doing some basic training stuff, some things that we know that works. We understand that reading the Word of God, there's power in the Word of God. And sometimes you need to read the Word of God. You don't feel like reading the Word of God. May I say to you, sometimes I don't feel like coming to church. 
Do you know on Sunday morning your children will spill their Cheerios? Your daughter won't be able to find her left shoe. Your son will begin to pull her piggy tail. And your husband will just be looking for something and he'll look at you and you'll, you'll, you'll look at him and say, why'd you look at me that way? For you know it, you're mad and you're glad you're mad and you've got a right to be mad and you get in church to come to the house of God and the devil's saying, just stay home. It'd be better if you'd just stay home. But the best thing for you to do when you don't know what to do is to do what you know you ought to do. And so you read the word of God and you come to the house of God. You come into the house of God, steam's coming out of every crevice of your face. Every hole has steam and smoke. Your eyes are red with fire. And you take the preacher's hand and he says, how are you? Be the preacher for me. And you squeeze it real hard and he's going, oh, good to see you. And you're saying, I'm glad to be here. And you come into the house of God and you sit down. And I want to tell you something. The moment you walk into the threshold of the church doors, the enemy's already mad at you because you know the word of God is going to be delivered to your soul. And if you've got problems, the best thing to do is don't stay at home trying to solve your problems. Come to the house of God. Determine to stand. Declare your salvation. Devote yourself to the shepherd. I'm going to say one more point tonight. I'm going to say two more points. Discover united strength. Come here, you two handsome young men. Come here. That's you, you two. Yeah, you're, you're amazed. Somebody's saying that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This is B. Virgil. What's your name? Stephen. Stephen. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Bear with me. Right. <laughs> Quit smiling. Okay. You're sad. Be sad. Okay, Be sad. <laughs> he comes in looking like this. <laughs> Broken hearted. Had problems at work. I don't know. I don't know nothing about you. And all of a sudden, Stephen sees he's down. Stephen comes over. What's up, friend? I love you. We're in this thing together. Amen. Following week, They're fast learners. Go sit down. We come to the house of God. We're not down all at the same time normally. I know sometimes there's things that will shake the feelings of the whole church as a whole. But I'm going to tell you right now, one of the greatest blessings of Calvary and the resurrection was the Lord gave us the promise of the church and birthed the church at Pentecost and we are a witness of the resurrection of the Lamb of God. We may not be perfect. And there might be a lot of imperfections within us but I still believe there's more right with the church than wrong with the church and I'm glad to be a part of the living body of believers and I believe in being a part of a local assembly and getting in here not fighting over whose potato salad is the best. Oh no, and not fighting over silly idle things but love on one another and encourage one another and determine that two are better than one Amen. Amen. my last point I preached this message down the road Wildwood Rewell Baptist and Wilson and I told him I said, you need to decide to serve if you're feeling blah. I encourage the teenagers, turn your social media off. Because when you get on social media, you look at all of these edited pictures of people on Snapchat and everything else. And they, they I mean, you know, 
when we put pictures on Facebook, I mean, my chin better be up like this. And I'm like, how much glow of heaven's on my head? And I, a lot of times I'll take my glasses off and I'll suck my belly in. And I'm like, now take 10 and let me pick one. And then I've tried to do selfies. I'm telling you, I've, I've done selfies and I've went, ah! I mean, it's really <laughs> scary looking at yourself. And some of you teenagers need to get out of the house. You don't feel like it. You don't feel like going out with friends. But sometimes we need to turn off Facebook. And we need to turn off all that twitting and tweeting and all that stuff. Because you got bullies. You have girls that will bully you girls. They'll tell you, you're not pretty. <laughs> you think you're going to get a prom date? And it'll depress you. And Satan uses these things against you. And I'm going to tell you, I'm a 50-year-old. Boy, I'm a handsome 50-year-old too. Say amen right there. If I had hair, you'd thought I was 47. But there's some things that we've got to do in deciding to serve is the last point. When I preached this in Wildwood, Darren, I love your name. I like your hair too. I was preaching and I said, some of the best advice I can give you is when you don't feel like doing anything is to do something for somebody else. I was walking into the church and I was admiring the grass was cut. And I thought, wonder if one of these people would like to go to Portsmouth and cut my grass. That's not been cut yet. Decide to serve. Decide to help a senior citizen get to church because they're depressed. Help them go get their groceries. Help cut their grass. Take a teenager under your wing and be a spiritual godmother and godfather to them. Begin to love on one another and say, listen, I know you're wanting to go to this missions trip. And, and you, in your heart, you just feel, you just don't feel really spiritual. But you know, I'm going to help you go. You, would you get some pictures and let me see them when you get back? And you start looking at ways that you can help other people. And I told him down at Wildwood, I said, when you don't feel like doing anything, I said, make me some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Next night I come to church, the last night. And a teenager come up with some chocolate chip cookies. Oh, I oohed and gobbed. I ate them too. <laughs> and then I believe her name was Karen. She brought me a batch of cookies. I looked at her and I thanked her. She heard the message the night before. Her boy was killed four months earlier. And she was doing all she could do just to survive. Hadn't given up their faith on God. And God certainly hadn't given up on them. But she was telling this preacher, I still have some usability. I still have a purpose. There's still something in my life that I can offer. My boy's gone. I can't bring him back, but I can go to where he's at. But while I'm here, I'm not going to live in a cave the rest of my life. Now, beloved, there's no condemnation. No one's pointing fingers at anybody tonight. We're just wanting to love on you. And I don't know who tonight may be broken in heart. Come and sing, I still trust you, Lord. If you're not saved, would you come? Jesus wants to love you. Maybe you're embarrassed and ashamed. I was down in Hayesville, North Carolina at the First Free Will Baptist. Darlene come to the altar. Darlene's about 60 years of age, I would suppose. Nice dressed lady, and she looked at my wife and I, and 
I asked her, I said, do, do you want to be saved? She said, I want to be saved, but I'm not worthy to be saved. I said, oh, honey, none of us are worthy to be saved. I said, that's why Jesus went to the cross. She said she'd been reading her Bible, and I began to quote with Darlene, for God so loved the world, and she started saying it with me, looking right in my eye, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and I stopped, and Darlene went, that whosoever. I went, what? She looked at me and she went, wow. I want you to understand, Darlene prayed a sinner's prayer that day, declared she was saved, and she kept saying, wow, wow. And when they called the 22 people up that were saved, and a lot of them were teenagers, I was back in that crowd of probably 700 people thinking, well, Darlene, Darren, will Darlene get on the platform? And here comes Darlene. And I'm back in my seat going, wow, wow. If you're not saved tonight, God's got a wow for you. And if you have any infirmity, emotionally, physically, spiritually, there's a healer in the house. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this message. For these people, they are so receptive to the preached word of God. And I thank you for that. I pray blessings on them, healing for the mind, strength for the body and the journey, salvation for those that are unsaved. May they come to you. We trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Sing a verse of that, would you? Altars open should you need to pray I've about seen anything. The righteous man Listen to my wife sing this song. And it looked like the wicked would go free. Let's stand all over the congregation. And in my frustration, it just didn't seem right to me. I ask you for sunshine. Come on, Pastor Todd's up front. You would you come? Rain. People are coming. Let's I mind the Lord tonight. Young people, God loves you. Teenager, God is crazy about you. You are wondrously created in the image of God. Don't allow the enemy, enemy or anybody to tell you you're not beautiful. You don't have a purpose. God has a plan for your life. I still trust you. That's right. This old dry barren land. And when I don't know which way to turn or go. I tell you what I'd like to do. Look up here at me. And I don't want to make anybody do anything they don't want to do. You saw that illustration of Stephen and Virgil. Would you dare to look around and see somebody that you might be able to go to right now and just look them right in the eye and say, Hey, I'm glad, we're, I'm glad we get to come to church together. I love you. Thank you for playing the piano. Thank you for being here to lift the offering. Thank you for running the cell. Just thank you for being here. Sing one more verse and one more chorus. I dare you to get out. I dare you to get out and love on somebody. You are the church. And we're to be known for our love for one another. If you need to pray, this altar's open, ever open, ever open. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord.
thank you, Father, for tears and smiles. Thank you, Lord, for the church. These are good people, Father. I still trust you. Oh, yeah. Amen. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. I tell you something. 